Good morning. My name is Staff Sergeant Carter, and this is my wife, Shannon. I'm an American soldier, just like thousands that have served, are serving, and will continue to serve our great nation. I appreciate your interest in the United States Army. A few weeks ago, I received a phone call from President Barack Obama. He was brief and to the point. He told me that he approved of my nomination for receipt of the Medal of Honor and that he was thankful for my service. We talked about our families and he said he was looking forward to meeting mine. I feel privileged to have even been considered for the Medal of Honor. I greatly appreciate the President's consideration and his phone call. I'm receiving the Medal of Honor for my actions at Combat Outpost Keating, Afghanistan, October 3, 2009. However, this war is not mine alone. I am grateful for the service of all the soldiers I fought with that day and would like to take a moment to express my sincere condolences to the families of those that did not make it back from the battle. I've heard reports that I won this award. That is not the proper way to address it. Yes, we did win the battle that day, but it was a team effort. With the support of Sergeant Larson, I was able to retrieve a wounded teammate, Specialist Stephen Mace, and we evacuated him to a relatively secure location for medical care. If it, wasn't, if it was not for the heroic actions of the other soldiers in our cavalry troop, the supporting aviators, and our Lafayette brothers, I might not be here today to speak to you. That day we were fighting as one team in one fight. My thanks to all of them for being the warriors they were and are today. I would like to thank my family, particularly my wife, Shannon, for her loving support and being the CEO of our household. Shannon and the rest of my family are my foundation and the reason why I chose to serve in the first place. Thank you, Shannon. With that, I will take your questions. Questions? We've read the description of what happened. Can you take us back through that day? Uh, take us back through that day um, when you basically were all bit ready to pack up and, and head out because you're being closed in a few days. So when you had forces and you just went racing, what's going through your mind? And, and if you could just point by point tell us what happened and, and what, from your perspective, you did. From my perspective, uh, the members of Black Knight Troop were attacked by three to four hundred Taliban insurgents from elevated positions. On that day, all I could think about was supporting the guard position that I was assigned to. When I first went out through the door of my barracks, concrete, sand, everything was spitting back at me because of the rounds coming in. So I stepped back, got a running start. That day, we all did what we could to, to keep each other alive and support each other's efforts. That, does that answer your question, sir? No. no? <laughs> I, um, if, if you could, well, because we've seen the narrative, take us point by point when uh, you and uh, Staff Sergeant Larson and the others received the uh, contact with the enemy, and then your efforts with uh, Staff Sergeant Mace to save his life. The, when I ran across the, the ECP to the LRAS, I basically, it looked like raindrops all over the ground. And the more impacts I saw, the faster I ran. There's no way that any one of us would have let each other down. Supporting the guard positions are what kept the cop alive, because that was our last line of defense. When I showed up, uh, Staff Sergeant Gallegos was on the 240 uh, pointing at the, I think it was Ermel. Sergeant Larson had the 50 cal, and he was pointing near the switchbacks, and Mace had his M4 pointed to uh, my left, which is, they call it the uh, diving board area. That's the nicknames that uh, Black Knight Troop gave these spots. I handed over the, uh, the ammunition that I brought with me for the 240 uh, machine gun. And then May started pulling uh, magazines out of my gear. When I saw that he needed ammo, my job was basically to support that position, so I gave up all but two of my magazines, one in my rifle, and then one left in my kit. And then I headed back to get the uh, ammo that they requested. Um, by that time, I think they, the enemy knew that that was a pa path of approach because the fire, incoming fire increased. So I ran harder. I got to the barracks. 
Um, everybody was, was doing what they could to support the positions because Blue Platoon's job was to support the guard positions. That was our mission that week. I was able to get the uh, lubrication and then I had to go to the, uh, the ammo supply point, shot off the locks, grabbed the ammo, and then headed back to the position. By that time, sniper fire, RPG fire, and machine gun fire had pinned them down inside the vehicle. I got in the vehicle uh, in an attempt to do what I could to help them out, and then uh, Martin showed up. After a while, it was finally understood that the enemy incoming firepower would ev eventually breach the armor of the Humvee. So Staff Sergeant Gallegos made the decision to exfil or leave the position. Sergeant Larson and I got out first to provide cover fire for Staff Sergeant Gallegos, uh, Sergeant Martin, and uh, Mace. As soon as we exited, uh, a barrage of RPGs came and pretty much knocked all of us over. When, when that happened, we continued, or they continued to push forward. Gallegos and Martin met the uh, full brunt of the first main breach of the ECP, and they died trying to uh, save us. So. Sergeant Larson directed me to get back in the Humvee, so I did. When we did, we locked the doors. Uh, he asked where everybody was. I said, I saw Gallegos go down. And in that conversation, I saw Mace crawling on his elbows, dragging his legs. I asked Sergeant Larson <clears throat> if I could get to him, and he told me no. It's very painful to see a good man suffer and then not be able to go to him when you know you can save him. So <clears throat> time passed. We did everything we could to fortify our positions. We were able to remove the wreckage that pinned the, uh, the turret open. We were able to lash it closed because the locks were busted also. Um, we continued to get, engage the enemy. Uh, I was shooting across the river to RPG teams and single-man rifle, riflemen. Um, he was engaging individuals up in the switchbacks, and we continued to do that for a while. Uh, during the exfil, or the fallback, another vehicle uh, tried to come up to uh, help us. They didn't have the sandbags that we had around our vehicle, which uh, took most of the impacts, the RPGs and machine gun fire. They were pretty much vulnerable. As soon as they showed up, their vehicle got high-centered and they couldn't exfil. Um, RPGs hit them from all sides and uh, breached their hull. They, uh, I'm pretty sure they were injured. Um, Sergeant Hart, um, Griffin, and Faulkner were in that vehicle. On the exfil, Sergeant Hart and Griffin died. Faulkner made it back, but he had wounds to his arm. More time passed, we were in the vehicle. Uh, we had no communications, and the enemy had already breached, and we saw the enemy actually carrying American-made uh, weapons. And after a while, we started considering the fact that uh, the firefight we were hearing would, might be the enemy outgoing with our weapons, killing us, trying to evade. So Sergeant Larson and I thought, well, if, if this is it, then the best thing we can do is wait for a low, low crawl to the river and float to the next base. There was no real area to escape. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to exfil. That was our home. That was our place. You defend it. And if, and if we couldn't do that, then there's nothing we can do about it. Eventually, I convinced Sergeant Larson to go to the vehicle and check to, for survivors, the one that was right behind us that helped us out. I didn't find anybody in there, but there was some uh, ammo and a few rifles. Um, I was able to bring it back to the vehicle and uh, we were both extremely low on ammo. So there was a small belt from the 249, which is a machine gun fires the same size round as the uh, M4. We were able to delink it and put it into our magazines. So each of us had at least um, just under one full magazine of ammo left. About that time, uh, I convinced Sergeant Larson to let me go get mace. So he got into a good position to provide me cover, and I went out and gave him first aid. Um, the original plan was to take him to a uh, underpass or a concrete 
area so he could have protection. But when I got down to where he was at, I saw that it was exposed to the river. And so I had Mace stay there, and I ran back to the vehicle to, to communicate with Sergeant Larson about the possible new change of plan. And we agreed the safest place would be back at the vehicle. So when I went to get Mace to bring him back, Sergeant Larson got out of the vehicle to provide better cover because both my hands would be used carrying Mace. We got back to the vehicle, and uh, Mace was still in bad condition. He looked like he was, uh, he was fading fast. And, uh, and Sergeant Larson let me go out again to uh, either establish communication with the, uh, the main force crossing the ECP or just do whatever I can to get help. Luckily, I found uh, Staff Sergeant Gallegos' radio and was able to bring it back so that we could coordinate um, an evac. When Sergeant Larson got on the radio, um, we found out that they couldn't send anybody to get us. It was too hot. But that, um, that everybody else knew where we were now and could do what they could to lay down enough cover fire to bring us back. And uh, that's, that's basically what saved all that what saved us was Black Knight Troop was able to, and the aviators were able to lay down enough firepower that matched, if not surpassed, the initial incoming firepower of that morning. We were able to bring Banks back to the aid station where he received the care and he was able to become more coherent from, uh, from, from them. After that, um, I was able to go to the barracks, put on some actual uniform because I was wearing my uh, tan t-shirt shorts and then my body armor and my rifle. I was able to grab my sniper rifle and then sit in the uh, cafe, which was a sniper position, to watch the putting green area, the switchbacks, that, that whole, that whole kind of fan. Um, there, uh, we stayed for a while. I was assisting a Lafayette sniper um, as a spotter, and he was the, uh, the gunner. Um, but then I was, I was told that uh, I needed to cut down a tree because the tree was catching fire and the fire was spreading to the aid station and there was too many critically wounded to move them. So I slung my rifle, went out there, made sure the chainsaw worked and I was able to uh, cut down the tree. The tree landed on the talk, which uh, coincidentally put out the fire for the talk. And then we spent the rest of the day continuing to gather our wounded, our, our killed in action, and retake the cop back. That's the best way I can answer that question, sir. When, when did you find out that Staff Sergeant Mace did survive? Um, later that night, um, there, we were, we were somewhat, we didn't, I, I guess I can say we, but it, it felt very draining through the day. And then finally, there was a, a sorrow that went through the troop because um, we found out that he was, he was killed and, uh, that's one of the main things that kind of affected me. So, uh, Drew, did you have a question? I did. Drew Mickelson from King 5, thank you for speaking with us here today. Um, you talked about convincing Sergeant Larson. Uh, and at one point, he told you something along the lines of, look, you're no good to Mace if you're dead. I mean, explain that, that thought process and, and how you convinced him to go out there unarmed to get Mace. I, I wasn't unarmed, but I didn't have my rifle slung. The, uh, the incoming firepower was so intense. If you look at the sheer numbers or understanding that there was five of us there at the fighting position, um, three men lost their lives there, and then there was also two men who lost their lives trying to support that position. That's the only way I can compare the amount of firepower that was coming down. When I saw Mace and I was told that I, I couldn't get to him, it, it broke my heart. You can see a good man was lying there, wounded, begging for my help. So dehydrated that he couldn't even have tears, but you can actually see that he was, he was in pain. Um, but Larson, being the uh, NCO that he is, great leader, he knew that, that if I went out there, I'd be dead too. And for that, I, I owe him my life. Um, when I was able to get to the vehicle behind us, um, it kind of signaled that, you know, maybe the firepower had shifted enough to where we can go get Mace. And that's what I think convinced him that uh, I can get him. What were your injuries? Who? Um, my injuries, I received uh, hearing loss, 
a little bit of shrapnel and a bunch of uh, scrapes and bruises and a concussion. Yes? I was just wondering, I had read in a, a, a previous interview you had done in Colorado um, that it was hard for you to go back to the Medal of Honor ceremony in, in, in January. I guess you had st stayed, you had not gone back for that um, and that just, it's just been recently that you've been able to perhaps, uh, you talked about just recently, you're able to talk about things more and uh, uh, I don't know if that's involved counseling, but I know these are all parts of the aftermath of battle and, and ones that we're all understanding more. And I know these are probably more difficult things to talk about, but it would be great to just get some sense of how you're dealing with things now and share that with us. I have, I have my wife. She, <laughs> she is, uh, she, she lets me know um, where I belong, if I'm off in my direction or if I'm saying or doing anything that is incorrect. She makes sure that uh, I, I know where my place is and that is by her side. Um, the, the, the ceremony f uh, for Clint Romache uh, is another incident where I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable about being around um, the families of the fallen because I, I feel that I owe them so much. Um, I feel embarrassed to be in their presence because they have lost so much. I've spoken with uh, Mace's mother and she is just an excellent woman to where I try to absorb strength from her. Um, also, yes, I've, I have done counseling. I have been in counseling ever since that incident. And because of that counseling, I am um, able to be a good husband and a good father. At least that's what, that's what she tells me. Um, and I probably will continue to go to counseling just so that I can improve and be able to speak to uh, individuals like yourselves. For that he's my husband so I love him um, I am truly honored to be here and be able to be by his side through all of these um, situations he um, he blows my mind every day you know just every little thing I couldn't be more blessed to have such a wonderful husband And I'm not sure what he told you about what happened. He may have said, oh, yeah, we had a firefight and everybody's going to be okay. But now that you've read, I'm not sure if you have read details. But knowing what he went through and the things that he did and the, the other men that, uh, that didn't come back and those that did, what, do you, what are your thoughts on the heroic actions of his? Um, it's scary. It, it was... Um, very overwhelming to hear what they all experienced that day. I am not, um, I could never wrap my mind around it, around the severity of what they went through and what they had to do because I, I've never been a part of anything so dramatic. So it was hard to understand and cope. Um, hearing it more throughout this, um, open, you know, he's talking about it more. It's um, heart wrenching. It um, it makes me cry. And when he had to go back to Afghanistan, it just made me relive everything that he had told me that it could happen again, and was very hard for me. But you know, you you just have to be here as a support system for him. I have to be strong. I have to um, help him be strong, and so that's what I try to do. Um, your bio says that you're going to be moving on to a cadre position at the Warrior Transition Battalion. Is that is that correct? If if they'll if they'll take me, um, one of the things. Once this has happened, um, I was actually checking in to be a, a cadre at the Warrior Transition Unit, an excellent unit uh, designed uh, kind of 
to to do the things that I'm going to try to do is get rid of the, the stigma of post-traumatic stress because there are a lot of soldiers out there that, that have it and uh, they're too ashamed to talk about it or to get the help and then eventually, whether it's now or in the future, it, it becomes an issue. Uh, Warrior Transition Unit I thought was an excellent place for me just because of my experience and the guys and the girls, or I'm sorry, the men and women that are there they would listen to somebody who's, who's seen it, done it, been there, and uh, I was hoping to play an excellent part there. Um, however, with this happening, um, I'm transitioning to what I'm doing right now to put the idea out there a lot better, and I think that was that's an excellent way to, I guess, utilize my, my service in the Army. After uh, I've completed this, this type of uh, job or task, then I'm definitely considering going back to the Warrior Transition Unit just to see what I can do to help them out. And when did you redeploy, and did you deploy, you deployed again to Afghanistan? Yes, ma'am. When was that? That was uh, eight months ago I returned, and then six months before that. Um, I deployed with uh, the Arikara Troop 8-1 Cav. Um, I, was, uh, I was a section leader. I had an excellent platoon, and uh, they uh, pretty much supported me, and I tried to support them the best we could. Um, luckily, the worst case scenario did not happen, so I'm very happy for those soldiers because of that and their families. Um, but you know, I've, I've, we've moved on, and, and now here, here we are. Um, does that answer your question? And if I could just ask one more, um, how do you feel about going to the White House? next month to receive this award? Extremely nervous. Um, D.C. is where it all started. The, you know, the independence, the, the history, everything. It, I'm looking forward to going there and if they, if they let me, if we have time to see the sites, um, to try to absorb some of the history. We've, we've tried to uh, get Jaden to learn a little bit better about it and feel pride with it. Um, but going to the White House and meeting uh, the Commander in Chief is truly an honor, and yes, I'm very nervous. Uh, what were you doing at the time of the attack? When it started? Yeah. I was in the front. Uh, you, that position was attacked so often that you get used to waking up to machine gun fire, and you get into a habit of just getting up, throwing your shoes on your gear, and going to your position. Uh, that day, my position was to support LRAS 2. Um, yeah, that's, that answer your question, sir? Okay. So you say that you do not feel as many that big of attack, just another day of general effort? Yeah. When you first wake up, you're still kind of groggy, but when I came to the front door and saw the amount of rounds impacting, I instantly thought something was different, but it wasn't until I saw the look on Mace's face when he was pulling magazines out of my kit that I truly knew that this was the, the main firefight. I got a question. Um, we see a polished staff sergeant sitting here now. At the time of this, you were a specialist out of Fort Carson in Colorado. Um, what are your thoughts on the Mountain Post and, and the fond memories you have of deploying out of there and the, and the men and women you served uh, with there? And, and as far as the people in Southern Colorado, how proud should they be? Colorado is beautiful. I loved being there. Um, I was going to extend there, but because my mother, Paula Carter, she lives in Spokane, Washington, uh, I wanted Fort Lewis so that I could spend more time with my daughter. Um, it's only a five-hour drive to Spokane, so I could fly my daughter up and uh, we could hang out at her place and, and enjoy that. I was able to meet my beautiful wife here and we have a nice place here and now my daughter can actually just come directly to us in fact, uh, we spent this last weekend with my mother. So Fort Carson, Colorado, the, the, the outdoorsy stuff, it's just a beautiful place. I have many friends there, and I hopefully we'll get to visit there soon. I have uh, Jaden, who's 14 years old. I've got Madison, who is eight, and I have uh, little Sierra, who is just over eight months. How are they taking this in? Maybe that's a question for mom. I mean, what, what do they think of their dad? And obviously, the, the baby doesn't know.
know much about this, but yeah. what, what's, what's this honor been like for them? Oh, well, it's been a little overwhelming. They're children, so they don't quite know what they're getting into. Um, Jaden, our son, the 14-year-old, he is um, very honored, um, doesn't quite know how to, how to deal with it. He's kind of stand, you know, quiet, and um, I think he'll get a, a, a wake-up call when we get to D.C., and uh, the eight-year-old, she is uh, just can't wait to go buy her dress. So, you know, <laughs> she loves it. <laughs> I a quick question, Staff Sergeant. I just wonder with the concussions and such that you spoke of, do you know? Do you have any diagnosis of mild TBI as as well? I haven't read the medical report. I've noticed a little bit of uh, memory loss. It's kind of hard to pay attention to certain things, but uh, I'm told that's just because I'm getting old. So. Good morning, Staff Sergeant. Uh, Staff Sergeant Chapman from the 5th Mobile Public Affairs Detachment. Um, quickly, uh, what do you think inside of you made you made the dis make the decisions that you made that day? A long time ago, I told myself that if I was ever placed in a combat situation, that I wouldn't let fear make my choices for me. And inside, all I thought about was supporting the men in that position. And then when Mace was down there, it was hard to think about anything else but doing what I could to get to him. One last one here. What was your initial feeling uh, when you were told that you'd been uh, recommended for Medal of Honor? I was still going through some uh, difficulties then, and I was so concerned about uh, the men that we lost and my good friends that it didn't even faze me. It's just, it was just another medal. Um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to put down the Medal of Honor or what it means. But when you've lost family, you don't really. It doesn't. Doesn't really. It doesn't phase you. It's not. It's not what you're thinking about. You just. Uh, I didn't feel angry that we lost him. I just felt the loss. I felt. Felt sad. I'm not going to ask it. There's 400 enemy forces bearing down, and you're just. 54. What does that say about your training, your fellow soldiers' training, that you're able to withstand that kind of onslaught? I have complete respect for uh, my NCOs and the officers appointed above me. They've, they did what they could given the situation. We spent most of our off time fortifying our positions and making it to where we could survive. Uh, attack like that. We, we brainstorm. We train to adapt. Um, on that day, with the support of all the aviators and the Lathians, we were able to uh, hold back, I guess you can say, the hordes and, uh, and win the day. But it, it was still the ex still extreme high price. Several were wounded. Uh, eight men were down. And then uh, another one uh, later from PTS died, Ed Faulkner, and uh, it's, it's just kind of hard to picture. You were a Marine Corps captain? Yes, ma'am. For when was your... Uh, I was in the Marine Corps from uh, 98 to 02. I was a combat engineer. And were you born in Spokane? I was. I graduated high school also from Spokane. What North Central High School. When did you know the enemy was in the wire? Was it by sight or a report you heard? By sight, okay. yes. It, uh, I think the first one that I saw was about 30 yards in front of me ducking behind a bush when we were trying to uh, exfil El Raz 2. Was there, was there a time you thought this was it? And Especially finding that radio, letting the others know that you were there so they could feel confirmed that at least your position was at least being held, that that kept everybody together. I didn't understand what you mean by this was it. Was there a point where because you didn't have any communication with the others, you didn't know if the enemy forces would just overrun your position? The, uh, the idea of this is it, as in the cop was being overrun, yes, that came to mind. Sergeant Larson and I discussed it, but at no point in time did we ever 
have it entered in our head that we were going to give up or surrender. Um, the training that we received and the trust and confidence that I had in my fellow soldiers meant that no matter what happened, we would fight until there was no, there was nobody left. So when you say this is it, the, the combat outpost was breached, the enemy was there, but this is it as in time to give up, that never, ever came to mind. You had mentioned there was a point where, not to give up or anything, but there was a point where you were unsure whether the rest of the post was overrun and you thought about going down the river to the next to the next uh, cop. Yes, there was a point. Um, like I said, we, we train and discuss worst case scenarios. Um, there's, there's a plan A, plan B, plan C, and it keeps on going. So if the worst case scenario of everybody else was fallen, and uh, we were still there to survive. We are still there to fight to their last round. You talk about potentially working with soldiers with uh, PTSD. I mean, is that something you're still, still battling, always will be? It's a PTS. Post-traumatic stress isn't something that just disappears. Um, <laughs> You utilize your family structure, the Army family and also your home family. You rely on their support to, to keep you moving along. Um, I felt that I would be an excellent cadre for the Warrior Transition Unit because of my experience with it. So I can take a soldier and just talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, hey, this is what's going to happen. It's not going to be easy and it's going to take a while, but you will improve. You will do a lot better. You just need to go and get the help you need. I want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to ask a question if you have any. Kevin, do you have a question? I do. Uh, Kevin McCarty with Cairo TV. Given your willingness to talk about post-traumatic stress with us the way you have and, and wanting to work with other soldiers and now getting a Medal of Honor, do you think you can become a voice for the Army and for soldiers where post-traumatic stress is concerned? If they let me, I would be honored to do it. Um, like I said earlier, Ed Faulkner uh, died because of post-traumatic stress. And, and there's a lot of stigma about it still. And so the Army treats it like as if it, it's, it's a combat wound, because it is a combat wound. It's something that needs time to heal. And the best way to do that is utilize the facilities that the uh, Army provides for the behavioral health, and whatever else is necessary. You have, you know, family, you've got the Army family, and uh, the stigma is slowly going away, but I'm just worried more along the lines as the, the new soldier who's trying to prove themselves by not seeking help. But in the end, it's, it's not effective for the Army family if somebody's having issues. So we train our NCOs to be active in their lives and also in their training to where if there is something wrong, then they can see it and assist in, uh, in getting, getting treatment for the wound. When you, uh, Rachel McCourt with AP, when do you anticipate serving in this new role? Well, I guess by me actually speaking about it, I kind of already have. I'm not sure if that's the complete direction that we're going to go, but if any, if any soldier um, needs help, then the facilities are there. And if I have time, I'd like to continue to assist individuals if they, if they need it. Chair of the KRD, you have a question? Uh, Sergeant Carter, you, you kind of alluded to this already. This is a question on behalf of KRDO in back in uh, uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, but you lived, uh, you were living in Fort Carson. You were a Fort Carson soldier at the time of these actions. Uh, this is either for you or, or Shannon or both. You know, what are your fondest memories of the Mountain Post uh, in your time there? And what would you like to tell the people back in Colorado Springs who are, uh, you know, honored uh, as well as the people here outside of Joint Base Lewis McCord? The Colorado Springs or Fort Carson. Um, one of the things that uh, sticks in my head is the beauty of the area. The, the Garden of the Gods, Seven Falls, um, even the incline is an awesome thing to, to work with. Um, the people of Colorado Springs are very friendly. 
Um, I've definitely spent some time, you you know, going to the the, the clubs and the establishments there, establishments there, and and in you know just hanging out. I have several very good friends that still are living in that area, um, and uh, they they should be proud not of me, but of the fact that that post uh, produces some excellent soldiers. I just wondering, Staff Sergeant, the, there's been a lot written, of course, about Cop Keating books, many articles, and the one of the things that's come out is, of course, the delays that kept the post from uh, closing on schedule, and all, and then of course the fact that it, after so much sacrifice, it was uh, closed. And I just wondered, when you look back on your experiences there, are there what ifs there, like what if it had closed earlier, or is there any bitterness there, or is that just not really part of the mix? It's not part of the mix. We don't, uh, we don't choose a lot of the things that happen to us in our lives. All we do is uh, try to cope as well as we can. Luckily, the members of Black Knight Troop performed excellently that day, and the aviators and Lafians, they, we made it to where uh, an impossible situation became possible, and that that I don't I can't forget, and I don't think anybody else can. We got time for uh, two more. Okay, Mr. Sergeant Carter, you got any closing comments? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out and thank you for showing your support for the Army.